Welcome. You are listening to the Fat and Furious podcast. In this podcast series, your host, Steve Bennett, father of seven, best-selling author and adventurer, will be joined by 23 of the world's most forward-thinking medical professionals. Doctors, authors, and top nutritionists, where he'll share the truth behind living healthier and happier for longer. Today I'm joined by the incredible John Gort. Now many of you will know him from his time as a journalist with The Sun. Others will remember him uh, as a radio DJ uh, on the BBC. But we're not talking about his journalism, we're going to talk about his journey. His journey where he has shed over five stone and he's put his diabetes into remission. Now, knowing John as I do, there may be the odd little, little faux pas swear word, but look, it's going to be worth it. He's a great character, he's got an amazing story, and I'm sure we're going to learn heaps from this incredible gentleman. Go on, T. Hi. Thanks for coming in, mate. Yeah, we should be doing that. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're watching this, uh, we're right in the, the early days of what looks like uh, what's going to be a pandemic uh, coronavirus. But uh, we're not going to talk about that today because we can get that from all our doctor friends. I want to know about your journey, uh, a fascinating journey. And many people watching or listening will know from the radio and the newspapers, but this goes out beyond the UK, sure. So tell everybody all about who you are, what you do, more importantly, your health journey. Okay, well, essentially, uh, when I left university, I set up a theatre company, I did that for some time, I did a lot of promotion of alternative comedy, uh, I went gloriously bankrupt, or the company did, uh, after about 15 years and the recession before last. And then what I did then was I um, fell into radio, because I was good at talking and I knew the councillors. So the local radio station, the BBC in Coventry, took me on to do a radio show. And I literally only did it because I had a little baby and I needed some cash. Uh, but then I had, after about six months, I had this kind of road to Damascus, St. Paul moment when I suddenly thought, blimey now, I can do this. All of my child, I was in care and I had you know, relationships and all this kind of stuff and running my nightclub and running businesses and knowing what the council was. I just suddenly had this light bulb moment. I thought, blimey, I was born to do this. So I did radio. Oh, and the best thing was the little bloke who owned, the, well, ran the station for the BBC, he sent me to America and he paid for me to go to Florida. He said, the only thing you've got to do, take your wife, take the baby, but get a 10 pound AM radio as you come through immigration and sit by the pool. And we went to this little grotty <laughs> motel in, um, where was it now? Uh, Fort Myers, which yeah. is really that posh place, Sanibel Island. So we're in Fort Myers, in this motel, and I'm listening to Reddit, and suddenly I heard all these American DJs, proper DJs, who spoke to you. And you know, those two guys who did a mechanical show, and you think, well, car maintenance, that can't be interesting. I'm not interested in cars. It it was, because they could tell a story, they could tell an anecdote. So I just developed this style. Um, and I don't know how I got away with it on the BBC, because I broke every rule. Well, I do, because eventually I won all these awards. And I got moved to BBC London. Um, and then I was away. Uh, so I was there. And then one day I had a phone call uh, from this guy. And he said, uh, would you like to write for the Sun newspaper? Which, for people who don't live in Britain, it was the biggest selling newspaper. Yeah, I think yeah, it still, still is. is yeah. um, phenomenal. So I said... Uh, yeah, I'd very much interested to talk about it. So I went to uh, The Sun. I met uh, Rebecca Brooks, who's now the chief executive of News, uh, News Corp, or whatever they're called now, Murdoch's company. And uh, she said, do you think you can do what you do on the radio? Do you think you could write that? I said, mm, I don't know, I'll have a go at it. And then the guy next to me said, we'll pay you this, right? And it was like almost footballers' wages. I said, I'll have a bloody good go. <laughs> and uh, so I got this job. So I, got, I became a columnist uh, on The Sun. So I had a whole page. I always remember, I phoned my dad. He was a copper, you know, well, a retired copper in Coventry. I said, Dad, I got this job on The Sun. It's fantastic. He said, how much? I, I can't tell you for obvious reasons. So I told him, he went, what? A year? I said, no, no, that's a month. <laughs> and of course, for a normal guy. And then that led on to other things. That led on to then I got a job on Talk Radio, uh, Talk Sport, which was mainly a sports radio station at that time. Again, all opinionated. And uh, I did a sort of um, phone in at 10 o'clock in the morning where it was current affairs and people ring up and moan and blah, blah, blah. And this was all before Twitter, all before Facebook. And I really enjoyed it. Um, 
And I found it as a way of being able to communicate to people. And I even found this on local radio. It, it allowed you to talk about the issues that real people want to talk about. And often, the people thought they'd asked David Cameron, the Prime Minister, that question, but it was me. Do you understand? <laughs> yeah. It's about yeah. creating that rapport. Uh, so that happened. And then I was, for about three or four years, I was at the top of the game, you know, had everything that everybody would dream of. Uh, Jaguars or Jaguars, as I called them, <laughs> uh, the Range Rovers, the Volvos, the massive house in Northamptonshire, commuted to London, um, never paid for anything effectively when you went in a restaurant because people knew who you were. It was a, a weird, weird world. But consequently, you get fatter and fatter and fatter. Um, I was diagnosed type 2 diabetes about, well, I keep saying 15 years ago, but it was about 18 years ago now. Um, and uh, I remember that moment when the doctor said, because uh, I had to give a sample, and it was almost the same colour as his brown cord carpet in the surgery. <laughs> so I knew there was something <laughs> up, you know. And uh, a week or so later, came back and said, it won't surprise you, you're type 2 diabetic. And did you and even know what that meant at that time? I knew what it meant, because my dad was a type 2 diabetic, but I cannot really put into words, and I'm sure people who are watching will yeah. understand what I'm saying, how... I mean, I've made jokes about it, saying, you know, your bum cheeks clang and all the rest. But actually, it's terrifying. Yep. Because they say to you it's a chronic disease, right? Yep. And by chronic, you don't really know what that means. You yep. think, you know. And then every the way they treat you, it's just as if you're going to go down this path, yep. which eventually will lead to having your foot amputated yep. or a heart attack or yep. a stroke or worse. Right? So my dad's, uh, well, he's 80 uh, in a few months' time. Yep. Um, but he was 78, went in. They told him the same. They say chronic. Yeah. Don't know. Like I say, though, my dad didn't know what that meant. They say irreversible, which he yes. kind of understood. Yeah. And degenerative, as it gets worse and worse. Yeah. We just keep giving you more and more medication. And uh, and yeah, my dad's same experience. Hor uh, yeah, horrific. And it is frightening. But let me tell you what the most frightening thing is. And I want to give this message to anybody who is a type two diabetic. All of what you've just said is right, and all of it is wrong, of course, because yep. you can reverse type 2 diabetes, yep. or certainly go a long way towards doing it if you eat the right way, low carb, high fat. However, what's worse than that is our reaction, probably your dad's reaction, yep. same as mine, that at first yep. we're scared stiff, so for yep. a month or so we take our metformin or whatever yep. tablet they give you, yep. and we try to eat how they tell you. Now, yep. the other problem is what they tell you to eat is largely wrong, but we'll come yep. on to that later. But you then get to a stage after a month or six weeks where you think, if I have the tablet, I'll be all right. Mm. And that's one of the major problems, in my opinion, with yes. treatment of type 2 diabetes. Yes. What we need to be saying to people is, you can reverse it. Most of you can, if you've certainly just been diagnosed, yep. or at least you can go some, some way to it. You don't need all this medication, or you need a balanced set of medication. Some doctors will disagree with me. I went 15 years getting more and more drugs. I started off on one metformin, people will be familiar with that. A lot of people can't tolerate it, it gives you, can give you terrible cramps and di diarrhea, if you don't mind me saying that, but that's what it can do. Yep. And it just went up and up and up. So then I got on Glickside. When I first, then when I found out about these tablets, when I, do you get your tablets and you take them out and you get that piece of paper, you just throw that aside, don't you? People should read that piece of paper with their medications because yep. it's blooming scary. Well, Glickside is basically a, a form of insulin in tablet. It puts on, according to Dr. Jason Fung, yep. great, who's doctor. One, yeah, great doctor, one of my heroes, a guru, yep. it puts on seven pounds a year on average oh. when you start taking Glixide. So then you go back to your doctor and they say, well, you need to be losing weight. And he said, actually, I've only put on weight since you gave me these tablets. <laughs> Fung talks about this yeah, in his book, yeah, yeah. Um, the, co uh, the Obesity Code. Obesity code yeah. And um, it's brilliant. But anyway, so. The whole way of treating it from the beginning is incorrect. They need to say to you, look, it's about lifestyle, change your food, but of course then we need them to change that eat well plate um, what, idea. The, the, the eat badly plate. Or the eat death plate. Is yes. that like a, a third of your diet being starchy carbs uh, or, or cereals. It's just nonsense. Anyway. Absolute nonsense. Anyway, so what we do, what happens That's is... why you're here, by the way, to help us champion that. Right, okay. the seam. And we had uh, Jason Fung on recently, actually. Great, great guy. But all the UK doctors that we work with, that we all want to either get rid or change that bloody plate yeah. that put my dad into... Diabetic yeah. and made you diabetic yeah. because all the guidelines are wrong. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't just blame the eat well play. I also blame me. Yep. I love my beer. Yeah. I don't anymore. I don't drink beer. I drink wine still. But I used to just drink too much. I eat the wrong food. 
Now, then ending up doing a show in London, you're going at five, six in the morning on the train, then you're finishing your show, and I used to do the breakfast show when I was in Luton, go out and have a fry up afterwards, but have it with chips and everything else, and then sweet. So I'm responsible as well, yep. but largely type two mm -hmm. diabetes is down to those guidelines and yep. to the medication. And my wife said a really interesting, wrote a blog about, she used to wait for me to, um, she called it the quietly despairing wife. I've been with her, married to her 30 years, was with her for seven years before that. She used to sit outside the doctors thinking, this time, this time, they'll give him a rollicking. <laughs> and, you know, but I used to come out smiling and she said, what happened? I said, oh, well, you know, talk to them. And they, what did they do? And I gave me another tablet and yeah. she'd go mad. Because yeah. I'm good at talking. So I'd go yeah. and flirt with the diabetic nurse. Almost <laughs> no, flirt with John, the, oh, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think most blokes are like that. Yeah. And then. So that all that happens is you keep getting these tablets. I ended up on 10 tablets a day. Oh. I ended up at 22 stone. Uh, I had gout. I had erectile dysfunction, obvious reasons. And uh, I also, uh, what else do I have? Gout, erectile dysfunction, uh, type two diabetes. My sugars were 91. Um, and, That's uh, high, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I mean the woman, uh, like getting a blood pressure test, right? So she'd go and come in like this and she'd put it on and then, and then she'd go. And then she'd go. <laughs> And then she'd say, I got it, take it off again. And she'd say, relax for a minute. And then she'd do it again. Because she was trying to get it anywhere near the Where guidelines. And she couldn't. Yeah. Um, and so I was in a terrible state. And I think I would die. Well, yep. It was about two years ago. I, I think I was sitting on the settee. Because by then I was no longer on the radio. And I was not writing for the sun, but I was doing other bits and bobs. And I think I was melting into the settee. I was like Jabba the Hutt. And you know what? I think I'm like many, many blokes in this world yep. who almost give up on themselves. Their yep. wives give up on them as well. Yep. And so it's just you're just kind of wait, waiting to die. It's yeah. it's it's pathetic. And, and 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 difficult for you, difficult for your wife and your kids. Just and because it happens over such a long period of time, that almost becomes the norm. For it the becomes kids, the it? norm. Bring me this. Bring me that. Yeah. Bring me the other. Right. Yeah. So I wasn't drinking cokes and all yeah. those things anymore. Yeah. But I was doing, as this plate says, yeah. I was eating. I used to eat a banana, thinking that'd be good for me. Yep. And Lisa's mum, my mother-in-law, God bless her, no medical training, she said, you know John with his diabetes? And so Lisa said, yeah, he doesn't half eat a lot of bananas. I don't think they're very good for him. And I go, shut up, what do you know about it? It's one of my five a day. I know, <laughs> six and a half teaspoons of sugar, of course, if it's yep. ripe, yep. when it digests. But I didn't know any of this, because the NHS, well, they don't know about it. Most doctors, don't understand what we're now talking about. Yeah, and that's that's not as slow on doctors, is it? The no. fact is that in their five years of medical training, yep. less than one day on nutrition, nutrition, doctors are great at identifying what's wrong with us and working out what tablets and medication we need and all that sort of thing, and that's what they're trained to do. But every doctor I've met so far, uh, including all the ones we've had on the show and, 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 and all of them, have said in the UK, less than a day on nutrition. And, and sure. therefore they just don't know. So you're on the sofa, you're melting into it. Let me tell you it. that. You, you've, been go, you've been diabetic for, for 15, 15 years. plus years. What was, the, what was the epiphany moment? The British Lions okay. play in South Africa two years ago. And uh, I got up early, because it was on about five o'clock or six o'clock in the morning. And I watched it, and uh, I was loving it, shouting and screaming and swearing at the telly and all the rest of it, and enjoying myself like I hadn't enjoyed myself for years now, looking back at it, when yep. I think about it. Because I was always a garrulous, I was always a joker, I was always... For the, but I think for about five or six years, I'd... I don't know if I'd call it depressed, but I'd certainly got into this cycle of nonsense and self-abuse in mm -hmm. terms of what I was eating. And so I'm cheering in that. And then Lisa comes into the room about eight o'clock and uh, she said to me, you're coming to the gym? Because we used to go to the gym twice a week, you know, the local virgin gym and work out. Didn't make any difference because again, afterwards we'd go and eat something, but eat the wrong thing again, like yeah. a, one of those cereal bars or whatever, yeah. or an energy drink. As the same says, you can't outrun a bad diet. Yeah, that's or right. he also says you can't, you can't exercise your fork. <laughs> no, you can't, you can't. And, and, and basically, um, so I said, no, I'm not coming. And she said, why? I said, can't you hear? I'm enjoying myself, and I'm gonna enjoy myself more than anything else. So then she gave me that look, you probably get the same from your wife, where you've got pictures, but no sound, <laughs> which is the worst thing in the world. It's like a telly on the blink, isn't it? And uh, she left, she went to the gym. I carried on watching the rugby, we lost, and then I thought, 
I'm not going to be defined by this anymore. Mm -hmm. By this, I'm going to get on top of this. And I'd been doing a load of work with um, anaesthetists all around the globe, going to these big conferences in America and, and the rest of it, and doing podcasts and showing them how they could make podcasts and the yep. rest of it. And one of them, he said to me one day, he said, uh, we've really got to get on top of people losing weight before we have operations. He said, because like a pilot of a jumbo jet, I can land it with three wheels or just two engines or one engine. But a lot of people back in coach are going to get shook about and might get injured. Yep. He said, it's like if I operated on you, John, yep. you might not come back around. And so I think all of these things sort of tied in together. Yep. And I, I just went upstairs and uh, I pulled on my trackies. And I was living in a place called Cubbington, which is about seven miles from Leamington. And uh, my daughter, Rosie, who had been at Oxford, but she'd, a big long story, but she'd had a big bout of depression. She said, Daddy, where, she's tw 20 at the time. Daddy, where are you going? I said, I'm going to walk to Leamington. She said, you're mad. It's miles away. I said, it's actually seven miles away. She said, I'm coming with you, because I think she thought I'd lost it. <laughs> so I said, no time for a shower. Yeah. Track is on like me now. So we went, right? and we walked. This is the actual day of the rugby? Yeah, that uh, day, June the, well, I can't, I've got, it, I've got it moved. Yeah, so yeah. I start walking, yeah. and she comes with me, and we talk about the problems she's had, and da 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 absolutely killed me. By the time I got to Lemon, I was almost crawling. And um, then she said, so what are you gonna do now? I said, I'm gonna do it every day. And so every day, I, and even now, I walk nearly seven, maybe 10 miles a day, depending. But I do walk. I certainly do at least 10,000 steps a day. That's well, an absolute then. core thing. Now, after two or three weeks, I wasn't really losing any weight. And then I just started research searching. And thank goodness for the internet. The internet is, is terrible for so many of the ills in society, but it's also a way of you discovering about your health. Yes. You've got to cut through all the stuff. And uh, I learned about low carb, high fat. I changed to that. I uh, started eating uh, low carb, high fat. So then I started walking to Leamington and my mate owns a butcher and he had, he had a cafe next door to it. So I used to go in there and I'd have, and this is not a word of a lie, I'd have a breakfast with bacon, two fried eggs. Uh, what else would I have on there? Maybe a bit of black pudding, uh, no beans, no carbs, no nothing. Wolf it down and the weight just dropped off. And then I, I had steak in the evening with mushrooms, uh, blue cheese salad, uh, just learning from other people who had yep, done similar sure. things. Um, and the weight dropped off. I lost uh, over five stone in about six, seven months, something like that. Went from 22 stone to under 17 stone. I've still got more to go. And then I thought, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a book about this. Yep. Because, a bit like you, because I thought, this is e relatively easy. Lots of people. Well, and you know the truth, it is relatively easy. Yeah. That's, the, that's, the, that's why my book's called Fat and Furious, because I'm furious. Because mm. I was obese for the vast majority of my adult yeah. life. And it's so simple when you know the truth. Yeah, and let me tell you a real classic about it. I go, I go to the doctors later. So I was at 91. I went out on HABC like three months later, and it was 71. And the diabetic nurse, she got the graph, and she, I think she thought it was upside down. <laughs> and then she said, and my blood pressure was really lowering as well. And uh, she said, how have you done this? I said, I don't really know how to say this to you, I said, but with the greatest respect, by ignoring the NHS and your guidelines. This is just my experience, I'm not telling everybody else to do it. And she said, what's well, amazing. And I talked to her about low carb, high fat. And just like you said, she didn't really have a clue what I was saying yep. about how starch is the new sugar and all the rest of it. Yep. So then, I, so then I said, uh, can I reduce my medication? She said, well, you need to talk to the doctor. I thought, oh, fair enough. Anyway, so another couple of months go by. I went back, because then I was getting a bit lightheaded and stuff, and I knew that I didn't need to be on all these tablets. I went back and they did it again, and it had gone from 71, 91 to 71 to 51. Um, so just above diabetic, yep. if you understand what I mean. And um, then the doctor said, same story. He said, oh, have you done this then? I said, I'm just walking and I'm eating loads of fat. And again, he didn't really understand. And I said, Look, I'll, I'll be non-diabetic when I come to see you again. Oh, I said, I will. Anyway, so I was. And um, so, yeah, that's how I did it. And then, then, I, then I got kind of angry, like you are with your thing. And I thought, I want to write a book about this and I want to tell other people. And also, I want to make a bit of money. I want to turn it into a business, and I want to show people how to do it, because it's not that difficult. I mean, it's just, it's hard if you just do it on your own. I found it hard, you know, on the internet yep. and stuff. So, um, and I thought, well, so I said to my, my uh, daughters, both of them, who obviously were massively relieved that I'd done this, and my wife, sure. you know, because 
all those problems, the gout, the erectile dysfunction, all those things had gone as well. The, yep. the, the mind fog had gone, you know, yep. the depression, the irritability. Um, and I just took myself all off all my tablets and yep. then the doctor said, okay, once he saw the figures. I didn't tell him, which I, again, I don't recommend. But um, then I said, right, I'm gonna write a book, Rosie, you can help me. And uh, I said, I'll write the book. And then she said, why do you want to write a book, she said. And I've written books before, I've written an autobiography and da da da. So, and of course I was a writer for the newspaper. So I knew I could do it. And she said, don't do that, Dad. Let's set up a website. And she said, I've got a name for it. So I said, oh yeah, what's that? She said, simple as fat, because it is as simple as that. Eat yeah. fat, yeah. write fat. Yeah. And so that's what we did. So we set up this website. It's taken ages to get it up and going and off the ground. We it's went brilliant, and, by the way. Oh, thank you very it's much. Brilliant. We went and... Um, Simpleasfat.com. We'll put a little link yeah. uh, below for everybody to, to uh, go and find this website. And not only is it brilliant, I love some of those stories on yeah. there. For, for Again, what I love is you haven't gone for the young demographic. You've gone for our age. and, and, and people, well, There are yeah. some young people on there, but, but real people, real stories, real before and after photographs, none of this... <laughs> Ball, whatever no. they call it, editing software. Real people, real stories, massive weight loss. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, thanks. Well, what I just decided, because well, I'd written for The Sun, I, um, I, I can write in a tabloid fashion. And when people slag off tabloids, they really need, you can slag off the politics of tabloids, but don't slag off the, the people who work there. Because to write tabloid journalism is the most difficult form of journalism to write. You know, and uh, I did lectures at one point in the Is that because you've got to get the, the story and... In ten make lines. It, and, and make it entertaining at the same time. Yeah, and entertaining. And I used to do these lectures and I'd say, oh, so you're snooty about the sun, are you? Well, there's the sun, there's the guardian. Go through it and do the count of the stories today and whether they've all got... And, of course, the sun has got every single story. Often on page two, it used to be opposite page three, of course, uh, little paragraphs. And it's about distilling very, very complex and difficult ideas down to a way that ordinary people can read it. And people who are busy. Yeah. Well, before email came, um, no, not e email was there, but before Facebook and um, Insta Twitter and, and all, all that those, stuff, yeah. when I was writing The Sun, you could almost set your watch for it. So you'd write it, say, on a Tuesday or whatever, it'd go in on Wednesday morning. you get some reaction on email about 7.38, guys and women going to work, then you get some more at lunchtime, and then you get some more straight after EastEnders. Now, that's because they don't digest the whole paper in one go, and that's why we have these things called stop. I learned all this from this fantastic editor called Chris Stevens. We had these things called stoppers, so sometimes you'll make a little funny quip, little story, like a, a sunspot, and that, you, you know, you're looking through the paper, and you're, oh, that's interesting, and then you see something else, I'll read that later. And that's how ordinary people used to digest papers. I mean, newspapers, as you know, are, are kind of dying at the moment. But weirdly, that's the same as writing social media, sure. Facebook. I shouldn't really be saying all this, I'm giving you all the secrets. <laughs> but it's exactly the same yeah. principle. So when it came to Simple as Fat, uh, I met all the people like you've met, you know, Tim Noakes and Unwin and uh, Asim Mahotra, and all, they're all heroes to me. But I thought there was a gap for somebody to talk in a very tabloid way, and it, it's all red and white, as you know, the website. It's deliberately like that, because I want to get to people like me and the class that I come from. Two reasons. One, they're the ones who are most affected by type 2 diabetes Agreed. and obesity. And number two, I think there's a genocide. You know, Tim Noakes, Professor Tim Noakes calls it a genocide. I think there's a genocide of the working class. Yep. Um, and I think I want to try and do something to Tim change that. Tim, Tim, Tim says that, and then there are other doctors are saying, we, we are sadly a generation that have been on this huge food experiment that's just gone horribly wrong. Absolutely. Horribly wrong. I mean, you know, go and watch uh, Saturday Night Takeaway uh, uh, with Add to Deck, you know. Of course, one of them drank himself stupid, the other one didn't have to. But, you know, good <laughs> luck to them, they're brilliant performers. But have you seen the adverts? I don't know if it's Deliveroo or the other, I think it's Deliveroo. You can sit there now, yeah. and there's this advert where the delivery driver arrives, and then mum hands out the food, and you know, they're celebrating the fact that you can have a McDonald's, you can have a Chinese, you can have a Burger King, and it can all be delivered in one go. I don't think that's anything to celebrate. No. You know, 15 ways to get type two diabetes, obesity, and probably add to other problems like Heart cancer, disease, cancer, all yeah. of it. Yeah. And 
you know, then I began to understand the lie yeah. of people like... Um, and while you're on that thought, just sorry to interrupt you, while you're on that thought, so that's Deliveroo. I was told by a very good friend of mine the other day who's right up in the business world. Yeah. He said, Steve, which company now has the biggest lobbyists? I went through all the ones we used yeah. to talk about. Yeah, the cigarette companies. Yeah, yeah. We talked didn't we, about companies. the drug companies, the big food companies, the coke cutters, McDonald's. He said, no, the company that has the biggest lobbying department in the UK is Just Eat. And I went, really? I, yeah. I, I didn't realise how big Just Eat is. He went, Steve, Just Eat now is in the FTSE 100. That means it's one of the biggest 100 yeah. companies in the UK value-wise. And all they do is a little bit of software that connects restaurant, well, takeaways to the public. They're the one of us, 100 valued companies in the UK. But my mate says, they know the SH1T is going to hit the fan really soon. Yeah. So they've got the biggest lobbying department trying to say, oh, no, it's not all about food. It's, about, it's our fault for being lazy. It's yeah, well, you're so right. I mean, you know, the microwave is a godsend, and if you use it for reheating the food that you've cooked yourself, it's fantastic, or defrosting food. But the moment you keep hearing ping, 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 and it's something you've bought, whether it's from Marks and Spencer's, Waitrose, or indeed, you know, any other supermarket, it's full of sugar, and it's full of salt, and it's full of additives. So just going back to what you were saying there about... Sorry I interrupted you there, you were just a the no, delivery no, no. one, you're absolutely right. When I yeah. then yeah. understood, like Gary Lineker, right? yeah. and I'm going to name him, yeah. he can advertise crisps, right? Yeah. Well, of course he can have crisps as part of a balanced diet. He's not metabolically challenged, yeah. he was a superb athlete, a great footballer, never headed the ball, but apart from that, <laughs> <laughs> he was a superb footballer. But for him to advertise crisps yes. to kids, I'm sorry, yeah. that's almost like being a drug pusher. Yeah. Inverted commas. Yeah. Likewise, why do McDonald's and Mars bars, why, why are they allowed to sponsor the Olympics? Why are they allowed to sponsor our England football team, both the women's and the men's? I'm sorry. And the FA Premier, of course, yeah. is sponsored by them, by one of those companies. My, and Coca-Cola. My point is, this lie of you can eat these things as part of a balanced diet, it's a complete lie. It's the same tactics as tobacco used. You know, they're good for you. You know, you're a similar kind of age to me, so you'll yeah, remember when a fag was meant to be good, yeah. yeah. And I used to interview all the tobacco lobby uh, when I was early on in ra radio, when I was working in Luton, because John Carlyle, who's the MP for Luton, uh, he then became the main spokesman for the tobacco lobby. And it's a very persuasive argument that you put forward, that if you don't, go to excess, you'll be fine. Now, as I say, Gary Lineker and all those footballers, they can eat a McDonald's and they can eat it more than once a week because they're brilliantly not, you know, metabolically sorted out and they're not got yep. insulin resistance, which yep. is the big thing. But they push it to everyone. And I don't think there's anything wrong. In fact, on our plan, on Simple as Fat, if you're caught short, we say go to McDonald's, get two cheeseburgers, throw away the bun and just eat the burger because yep. it ain't... The burger, it, this is why all this anti-meat lobby at the moment drives me mad. Yeah. It ain't the meat, yeah. it's the bread. Yeah. And what do you mean the bread, John? The sugar, yeah. the starch. Anyway, so... And for those that don't know what John means by that... It's all in your book. It's in the book, but also we, we took a subway the other day, yeah. the 12-inch subway. We got David on winter check the data. Mm. The subway took all the filling out, we weighed it, with no butter, it was completely just the bread. Yeah. Gave the data to David on when he came back. Just the bread on the 12-inch subway, the equivalent on the blood glucose level of 15 teaspoons yes. yeah. of sugar. Yeah. Scary. It's like when I was doing my anaesthetist thing, you know, going around the world, literally around the world, we ended up with a big conference in Dingle in Ireland, and um, they put on a great, I was going to call it an English breakfast, it was an <laughs> Irish breakfast, and it was a buffet, and you could have yeah. whatever you wanted. Yeah. So I chose loads of bacon, uh, a sausage, uh, a bit of black pudding. I think they had white pudding as well. You've got to be careful with black pudding, but I had that. Uh, I can't remember what else I had. Anyway, then a load of female doctors came down and sat on my table, and they were interested in talking to me, you know, about what I did in my life and stuff. And they had the healthy breakfast. And I could see them looking at me going, oh, I know why you're fat, uh, because <laughs> you are eating uh, bacon, whatever. But they had bran flakes, or something similar to that, at a healthy cereal, and they had uh, a glass, massive glass of orange juice, toast, um, and skim milk. Now their sugar, and um, sorry, their breakfast had much more sugar than mine. Yep. Nobody knows that. Yep. And so one of the things I want to try and do with Simple as Fat, and I know you're trying to do with Fat and Furious and, and with Primal, is to tell people the facts. Yep. And then they can make their own decision. I don't want to be, mm, don't do this, don't do that. Yep. I don't want to be the nanny state. You know, that's why yep. I'm, I'm dubious about the sugar tax and the rest of it. I think we need to attack manufacturers, but individual choice. And I'm also very aware 
that the areas of, say, Coventry, where I come from, places like Tile Hill and Wood End, these huge council estates, and whether they're mostly black people or Asian people that live in there or mostly white, it's irrelevant. What's happened is, the parade of shops has closed yep. down. Yep. These people haven't got the money to get into town. Yep. But when a massive um, uh, frozen food company opens, <laughs> that's where they're going to get their food from. Yep. And here's the proof. And you saw that on the way in here today. Look yeah. what's happened right outside our TV studio. The TV studio is designed just to promote health. In the last year, we've had a Subway a open Greg's, up next door, a Greg's right next door, oh, and the McDonald's is already there. Yeah. Only three food choices within sensible walking dis distance of a massive industrial estate is unhealthy let, bread. Let me add to that as well. With this coronavirus, you know, um, obviously there's been a shortage and most people must be eating toilet rolls because you can't get them anywhere. I don't know what's going on there. But when you go into the supermarket, Steve, yep. if you go and have a look in the freezers for the processed food, the mm -hmm. ready-made pizzas and all that stuff, the ultra-processed stuff, mm -hmm. and of course the pasta, you can't see it. It's gone along with the toilet rolls. Go into the vegetable oil, <laughs> oil aisle <laughs> and there's loads. Yep. And that's what I'm basically saying, and I know it's what you believe in as well. Yep. Eat real food. Yep. Cook like your granny used to cook, not yep. your mum, because we've got a generation who can't cook. Yep. Cook like your granny cooked yep. and cook from scratch. Yep. And cook in bulk. Yep. And then freeze it down. Yep. Use your freeze flour the way you should use it. Yep. And then you'll never be tempted to have uh, pasta when you get in late. And you, we've all done this. We're driving home. And it's eight o'clock. I used to do this when I was working in London. I'd be at Marylebone, and for some reason I've got caught up in the traffic, and I'm late. So then I would get home, uh, I'll drive home from the station and go to the Chinese, go to the Indian, go to the chip shop, whatever, or go to McDonald's. Or then I thought, well, I'll be a bit healthier. I'll go to Marks and Sparks, because they're everywhere, aren't they, yeah. in garages, and I'll get one of those tomato sauces. That'd yeah. be all right, won't it? Yeah. So you get a cooking sauce, go home, put a load of pasta on, put this cooking sauce on top, and the amount of sugar, it's yeah. like that. You may as well have gone and had the Indian, because yep. if you'd had a tandoori chicken or if you'd had a, a bulti, <laughs> so it would be much better for you, yeah. right? Yeah. People don't understand this. Yeah. And, and then, how do you, and my, my daughter Rosie, the one I was talking about before, she lived in Italy for four years, and I used to make a tomato sauce, right? Tins of tomatoes, some fresh tomatoes, thinking I was being really healthy. And then I'd put in some, um, uh, some oil, and then to counteract the oil, you put in loads of sugar, right, like this, right? <laughs> she taught me how to make it, right, with either fresh or a yep. combination of fresh and a, a tin of tomatoes, yep. plus some balsamic vinegar, which is what the Italians do, which give it a sweetness, yep. and then uh, put in um, your garlic and your onion. Uh, red onions, because red onions give it a sweetness as well. But then you've not got the sugar. Yep. Anywhere near what you had before. Now, you make that and you get a huge pot Mm -hmm. right? And you make a load of it on a Sunday, yep. let it go cool, put it into bags yep. or Tupperware, other plastic vessels yep. are available, <laughs> and you put it in the freezer and then bang, you come in from work, yep. oh, I'm a bit hungry, I'll have that. Yep. Get a bit of cold chicken that you've had before, or if you've not got any in, that's what you buy from Marks and Spencers, yep. yeah, or garage or whatever. Yep. You come home, whack that in the sauce, and then you're going to be eating healthy. Because the combination of pasta yep. and shop-bought um, sauces yep. is literally killing you. Yeah, totally, totally. totally and totally that's agree. what we've got to get into people's mind. And then people say, oh, yeah, I ain't got time for cooking. And you say, have you not got time for your own health then? You've not got time for you. And I think that's what we all need to do. And I think you just, just need to take time. For, for people to say that, you've just given a, a nugget of information that we've not covered at all yet, and we've done, I don't know, 30, 40 podcasts. Um, you've just given a nugget of information there that use your freezer for what it was designed for. Yeah, and your that's micro. Great. That's great, because you're right, sometimes people haven't got time Monday to Friday, but might be having an hour free on a Saturday or an hour free on a Sunday. Go make a mass, go and buy yourself a massive big cooking pot. Yeah. Fill it, fill it, fill it, stick it in the freezer. Well, and, and make the sauce, yeah, here's, here's a great example. We've just done a little thing on Simple as Fat, uh, which is um, 10 foods, 10 foods you can bulk cook. Yeah. So, obviously, chilli. Yeah. Uh, we make a chilli without the kidney beans, because the kidney beans are full of starch, but we've got loads of red pepper in. Make a huge pot of yep. chilli, yep. then chill it down, freeze it down. Lamb ragu, yep. lamb mince yep. with some smoked bacon in it, some onion, oh, oh, it's nice. fantastic. And when you reheat that, you whack a load of cheddar cheese on top. Oh, by the way, never buy grated cheese. Do you know why? I didn't know that at all. You I'm must gonna, not I'm going to learn something now because I do buy it. Go on. Do you know what they put in it? They put wheat flour to keep... This is all part of the big food you con. You are joking They put me. a flour in there so the bits don't stick together. You being a I lazy so-and-so, you don't, can't be bothered to grate week. it. I no, buy don't week. buy it. 
Don't buy it. Thank you for that. That's all right. Thank so, that, that. so that's that. I so never knew that. No, that's true. And there's loads of things. Like, oh. you, you can use pork... So here's another Because it's just been lazy. I've got, I've got it a is lazy. I've got a You've got a home. You've probably got a food processor. Yeah, Put it in there. <laughs> uh, the other classic... The other classic is... Um, Using pork sausages, go and buy some pork sausages yeah. from the butcher, local butcher, support yeah. your local butcher if you can. Yeah. As long as it's got over 95, 97% pork in it, then buy a vegetable that many people don't even know exists, which is called fennel. People know about fennel no seed. Fennel. Fennel's yeah. a great taste. Yeah. Get your fennel, yeah. get your sausage. I like doing this, but maybe I'm a bit perverted. <laughs> Squeeze the meat out of your sausages, right? Yeah. yeah. You only need three for yourself. Yeah. Squeeze it out. Yeah. Fry that up with a bit of onion and fennel yeah. and a bit of tomato, either fresh or tinned. You can freeze that as well. And then that's another superb meal. So there's right. lamb ragu, pork ragu, yeah. uh, chilli. There's a whole load. And yeah. I'm also a massive fan of another vegetable called celeriac. Oh. It's, that has transformed yeah, my recipes. Right. And in my first cookbook, we didn't, I don't think we've mentioned it once in my first cookbook. Yeah. And now I think that we're working on the second one. It's probably in about 10 different, isn't it? I'm so flexible. Yeah. I said to my wife, it's the ugliest vegetable in the green grocery. She it said, is. Not when you're in there. <laughs> <laughs> bum, bum. I'm here all week. Anyway, so she, she, she. <laughs> so you, you, For those that are listening to the podcast <laughs> and not watching the video, he's gorgeous. Really. He's <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> So with celeria, it is ugly. You have to peel it, yep. and then you get it, and then you dice it. Now, you can use celeria for everything. Celeria mash, yep. uh, you can use chips. it. Chips. Yep. You can use it. Any way you use a potato. Roast potatoes, yep. you can replace them. The only problem is celeria, it's like a combination of, what would you say, a parsnip and a turnip. Yeah, it's got a the slightly flavor. different taste. But yeah. the second you get used to that, I mean, we did, we actually did it this weekend, just gone, we made chips out of it. Yeah. Because you've got, with the kids, you've got to... A, educate them, but you've got to undo all the bad things I've yeah. done to my kids over the years before I learned. Because it's Especially your fault my, and my fault. It's all my fault. My yeah. oldest two kids do struggle with their weight. Yeah. Uh, we've got a 30-year-old daughter, well, just turning 30 this year. Uh, I've got a 29-year-old daughter, 28-year-old son, and uh, I've poisoned them most of yeah. their life. And I'm having to undo that. Yeah. And, and, and I'm even having to undo it for my younger kids as well. So you still got to make food look like the food they want. Yeah. So I, I, I make tiny little chips out of it. Yeah. Um, but once they got used to the flavour, they forgot what the I find, I find with the chips that if you put the chips with olive oil or uh, I know you're a great believer in this uh, coconut oil yep. put them in the oven like you put an oven chip and then yep. when you take them out just get the roasting pan you done put that on top of the cooker and turn the rings on and then just maybe a little bit more oil bit of Morden sea salt I like flakes yeah, flick nice. it over and then just shake them around yep. for maybe five minutes then they crisp up and it's really nice because they the, are what, what, watery what, what does the putting it on the grill? it crisps them does it it crisps yeah. them more than it'll ever crisp them in okay. the oven uh, that's All of this, you should have had my wife here, because she <laughs> or my daughter, because they're the ones who've been inventors. Yeah. Uh, going back to that Italian tomato yeah. thing, yeah. Uh, you know, another secret of Italian, real Italian uh, tomato sauce is just to get the whole garlic, the whole garlic, the yeah. ball, drop it in top. Don't even take the skin off it, yeah. and then that melts down. And then the best thing is a bit like when your mum used to do cooking with cakes. Yeah. Everyone wants to fight for the spoon and lick the bowl out. <laughs> Everybody wants to fight and get the ball. The Squeeze the it into him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, brilliant. And so I just I found... love roasting garlic. So yeah. Again, same thing. I just so good chop, for you. Chop the top off, yeah. stick it in the roasting tray with all the vegetables and then squeeze it out. Yeah. Oh, gorgeous. And of course, great if you've got a cold or to ward off colds, yeah. uh, garlic. You know, there's loads of things. Gar garlic, turmeric, all these things. And, and so I just suddenly learned this. Now, if people are listening just on the audio side, yep. I'm still fat, right? But I no, have lost. Not. No, I am. I've lost five stone, right? Yep. I was morbidly obese. I'm still obese, right? But I won't be well, for you long. You've only been doing this two years. Oh, yeah. So you did about right. eighteen months doing it. But right. I won't. But then again, also I was worried about getting baggy skin because when you had a gut like me, right? That's what I'm worried about. That. So I'm just taking it steady. Yep. But then I realised, Steve, and I, I really want to say this to everybody who's for fat. Three caps that if, for those that are just jumping halfway through. You've reversed your diabetes. I reversed my type two diabetes. Got rid of erectile dysfunction. Got rid of gout. Yep. Cleared the fog in my head. Yep. My skin is. You know, I'm 59, but I don't look 59 nope, anymore. You don't. Um, Oh, that sounds really big anyway. Hey, no, I, I, I thought no. we were the same age, I'm 54. Yeah. So, yeah. so, and I've rediscovered the joy of life. Yeah. I want joy in my life. I've had yeah. too much fed upness. Yeah. Anyway, uh, what was I going to say to you? Um, yeah, so I've done all those things, but I've still got to lose more. But I didn't want to get the baggy skin thing. And also, I suddenly realised it ain't about target weights. No. Nope. And it ain't about weight even. No. Nope. Never ever become uh, a slave to the tyranny of the scales. Yeah. 
One of the techniques I did, I bought a pair of them. I had a 54-inch waist, so I had to buy everything from... Um, I can't say it, can I? Uh, fat, illegitimate son, so dot co dot uk. Um, actually, th those sites were my saviour because you yeah. can still get relatively fashionable stuff. Yeah. But I bought a pair of chinos, and they were Farrah, right? Farrah make that mate, and they're brilliantly made. I give them that. But I bought a pair of fifty four and they're in khaki, and then I decided I'll buy a pair of 52. And I put the 52 on my bedroom door, on the hook, right, inside. And I looked at them every night, I thought, I'm gonna get into you there, yeah. I'm gonna get into you. And I've done that all the way, Correct. down to, I'm about 39 at the moment, so I've lost about, what's that, uh, 15 inches off my waist. Fantastic. Now, I say to everybody, take a photo and of me. And here's the craziest thing, hey? What? For every inch, it's all in the book, for every yeah. inch you lose on your waist, yeah. on average, Statistically, prolongs your, life. prolongs your life by two years. Yeah. So you've already added 30 years to your well, life. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Statistically. Yeah, statistically. But also what I found was, um, I found that a great motivator. But I always say to my people, get your, your lover, your yep. boyfriend, husband, whatever it is, yep. significant other, to take a photo every week yep. on the same day, just in your underpants or your bra and pants. Keep yep. it for yourself. No one yep. else can see it. Yep. Get a notebook and write down your collar size, your yep. chest, your bust, whatever, all the way down to your ankles. Yep. Because it's a great motivator looking back. And then, if the scales don't move, because I don't know whether you found this, sometimes you've lost no weight on the scales, but your clothes are hanging off you. Yep. It takes a bit of time for it's it to catch we, up. And, it's because, and also because we've retained so much water yeah. some days and other days we don't, depending on what we're yeah. eating. So you can see it going up and down quite a lot. So you, you're right that there are other ways rather than just jumping on the scales to measure. I did the same as you. I've got my, my obese self photograph on the inside of the, uh, yeah, of the I've cupboard. I've got, yeah. the, I've got it everywhere yeah, in my yeah. house just because I just to remind myself, I don't want to get back there. Yeah. Don't want to go back there. And I've just got to a stage now where I do want to be thinner, uh, I, but mostly I want to be healthier. And yeah. so when people say to me, oh, you haven't done this, you haven't done that, and they're usually thin people who have never been fat or certainly have never been type 2 diabetic, it all feeds into this idea that type 2 diabetes, is, and also because they call it late onset, that somehow it's all down to the fat person or the diabetic person, it's their fault. And it is, there is personal responsibility, but the largest part is this, the lies. Is yeah. the lies and the food industry. Yeah. And that's why I like a scene Mahotra, because we often talk about food and we talk about junk food, and thereby we immediately in our brains see McDonald's and, and the rest of them, Kentucky and all the rest of it. But actually, it's the ultra processed food yes. that's on the supermarket shelf. Yes. Why did they, you know, why is there such a push? I mean, I'm not anti vegetarian, by the way. Yep. I'm not particularly pro vegan, but yep. I'm definitely not anti vegetarian. Yep. I had a beautiful aubergine parmesan uh, dish last night that for a meat eater like me, yep. You know, or basically, you probably know, it's aubergines, it's tomato, it's loads of garlic, and it's loads of mozzarella, yep. and then loads of parmesan on top. When you eat it, it feels like you're eating meat, like mm -hmm. a mincy sure. lasagna. It's just fun. In fact, it's better than a meat one, in yeah. my opinion. So I'm not anti-vegetarian, but this whole anti-meat, this nonsense that cows are going to destroy the world and, and the rest of it, why are they pushing that line? I'll tell you why. Because they want you to eat cereal and ultra-processed. And then you talk to a veggie or a vegan, and I won't say the manufacturer's name, but they're eating that stuff that Mo Farah eats, yep. and it's grown in a blooming laboratory. Yep. I'm sorry, I'd rather yep. have Daisy the cow, yep. or her, her mate, yep. who's eating grass, grass. Proper grass. Proper grass. Like they always have them. Precisely. Yep. Not, I mean, obviously not. And then they do that lie where they, they talk about the Americans, where the Americans keep them in sheds and feed them rubbish, and feed them stuff that cows were never meant to eat. Yep. I'm not in favour of that. I want free range pork. I want free yep. range grass fed beef. Yep. But if you eat that, how can that, how can that be bad for you? Yep. How can it be bad for you? It's my favourite subject I could spend hours on. And the reality is we should, the vegans, the vegetarians, and actually the meat eaters, we should all be on the same side. We should. The side we should be fighting is real food against fake food. Yeah. And you're right, the meat that grows in the sheds in America, because it is terrible in America, it's horrible. that's why we shouldn't have their food standards imposed on us. Now we're coming out of Brexit, because their food standards are rubbish compared to the UK. Their cows in sheds probably do have a negative effect on global warming. The cows that roam and eat grass like they've always done have a positive effect yeah. on global warming because they eat grass and grass grows and grass sequests carbon dioxide and that offsets by far more than the, the belching and the farting and the methane <laughs> and so on. So you've just got to, another doctor, amazing doctor, Dr. Patrick Holford says, 
Follow the logic and not the money. Yeah. You know, look at the logic. Of course, cows are good for you and good for the planet and da 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 da. And again, I'm not anti vegetarians at all, as long as they're vegetarian for the right reasons. If they're vegetarian because they don't eat cows because for religious reasons, or they just love pet animals and all that, totally get it, fantastic. But if they're doing it for health reasons, they're wrong. If you're doing it for environmental reasons, they're wrong. So mm. you just need the truth. Well, it's like. Get back to the truth. It's reasons. like my daughter's. Boyfriend, her mum, and him, but she's she's a Hindu, right? And she's got a fantastic vegan restaurant now in Oxford. She's a vegan, but she's also a brilliant cook. Yeah. So she's making sure she gets all the right stuff. And of course, the only thing you can't get on a vegan diet is B12. So she yeah. has B12 supplements, which no doubt mm -hmm. uh, you sell and you supply. Okay. But that's what she does. But she's a proper vegan because yep. she's a Hindu. Yep. So she would never go anywhere near a cow or a piece yep. of beef. And I fully appreciate that, yep. but she's eating properly. But if you're vegan and you're having a Kentucky Fried Chicken vegan burger, <laughs> behave yourself, yeah. right? And that's what's wrong. And yeah. I feel our young people particularly yeah are being conned. Yep. And it's just the food industry creating a whole load of new customers. Yep. And then of course, you've got, you've got big food and you've got big pharma. And I don't mean pharma Giles, I mean P-H-A-R-M-A. Because yep. then when you get fat and diabetic, they'll give you the tablets. Yep. And not only will the tablets attempt to cure you, they'll get you fatter yep. and more diabetic. And then feed into that idea that I said right at the beginning of this interview, that as long as I take the tablets, I'll be all right. Yeah. Well, you won't. You won't. And that's what my and, message and, is. And your good friend, a very good friend of yours, I know, uh, he's been on the show a few times, uh, Dr. David Unwin says, yeah. GPs should be in the business today of following the logic yeah. and wherever possible, de-prescribe. Yes. But then David said, I'm so embarrassed in some sense that I spent my whole life prescribing, prescribing, prescribing. But today, I now look at the logic. How can I help somebody change their lifestyle mm. instead of prescribing? And if anything, I'd love to try and de where it's safe to do so, Take them off the medication, but, take them off the And nurse. I think my, my, a lot of this, when you talk to people about low carb, high fat uh, diets, a lot of the medical industry say, oh, it's not sustainable. People will fall off it, they'll do this, they'll do that. Well, I don't want to be rude, but is Weight Watchers and Slimmer's World, which I've both been to both, are they sustainable with their sins and they're counting their calories? No, because I think the percentage rate well, of people would go back. Of course they don't. They, they and here's the be, best one. They don't want it to be successful. There's 10 food companies in the world in the yeah. end, as you probably know. Yep. But Unilever yep. used to own Weight Watchers and Unilever now provide all the, um, the ready-made food for Weight Watchers uh, via Heinz, who they own. And so the, I used to go to Slimmer's World and I used to win it some weeks, you know, you're a slimmer of the week! And you get a certificate, right? You feel like you do your cycling proficiency again, or whatever it is, or your swimming star. And they give you this certificate, right? And then they go, well done! Have our new chocolate bar, or have our new peanut bar, or have a, have a ready meal. And it's like, uh, it's no. And that's why Fat Marjorie, yeah. up at the Village Hall, doing that, and I'm sure Weight Watchers, and I'm sure Slimmers will have success. I'm not, you know, but, I don't think you need fat Marjorie. What you need is to educate yourself, yep. uh, start eating properly, start walking, and that's all we try to say on Simple As Fat. That's all we're trying to do. Yes. And um, my mission statement, I guess, was just, I know there's loads of people like me, loads of fellas, and we've been dead lucky because we had those fellas at first, because of my writing and because of my um, radio personality and TV personality, people knew me. So it was great to get people to sign up at the beginning. Big blokes like you've seen, like yeah. James, who is a, he's a security guard at Tesco's, but he's a part-time funeral undertaker, right? He's lost four and a half stone with us, right? Brilliant. He's a proper bloke, tattoos, yeah. all, all the stuff. But they, they signed up, and then we didn't have many women. And then over the period, about 12 months since we've been really sort of cooking, We've, <laughs> cooking. we've <laughs> then got um, women. Yeah. And I think what these women have done, I think they've looked at their old boys, their old fellas. Yeah. They've suddenly got a bit fitter. Life's got a bit better in, uh, <coughs> in, yeah. all, in all regions. Yeah. Um, I once met somebody, actually, who was very <laughs> interested in coming in with me on this project. He said, all you've got to do, tell, John, is tell the lads that they'll get a proper erection and their love life will be better and they'll be signing up out the door. And he's probably right. But anyway, going back to the women, they've looked at their old men and they've gone, if he can do it, I can do this. I've got a bingo wing here or whatever. Yep. And we've had some ladies lo losing like three stone. One lady, um, Lynn, she's just a normal woman, 50 odd. She's lost all this weight, three, three and a bit stone, right? 
And now she's doing burlesque dancing in an amateur burlesque. Fantastic. Group because she's got confidence. Because yeah. that's the other thing. You know this. Yeah. When you were fat, you'd walk down the street like that, wouldn't you? Away yep. from the window. Yep. And it's that moment when you're in Marks and Spencers or Debenhams yep. and you're going, Lisa, bring me the next size. Up. And then she comes back and she says, there ain't no other size up from this, right? And then you're into having to go to Giacomo or whatever. Yeah. How great does it feel, that moment when you're in the dressing room and you go, Lisa, bring me the next one. Down. And loads of people have said that to me. Yeah. And that's what it's about. Because then that gives you confidence. Then it makes you feel that life's worth living. And then it makes you just a nicer person. Because the other thing I've learned on this journey is that you need to slow down. You need to be a nicer person, a kinder person. Um, you can still be aggressive and all those things and, and striving, but just take a bit of time. And so I've got more into that. I've got into, I say to my people, not at the moment because of this virus, but I've been saying, go to the cinema once a month with your wife or your husband or whatever, watch a film. It's a great, it's about the only time in modern life, apart from the dentist, when you're not gonna get interrupted because it's in the dark, your phone can't be on, you watch something good, after it then you share your experience and your interpretation of what you've seen, and it allows your brain to expand. I must just tell you this way, I used to walk and not have anything in my ears. So I'm going a bit deaf, so I've now got these really superb earphones, uh, what are they called? Earpieces. Ear, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, the guy said, do you know Bluetooth's? He said, can you listen to music? I thought, I ain't gonna be listening to music and DJ. <laughs> but what I got was Audible. Yeah. So I've now we using Audible. So I now listen to fantastic books, books that I've always wanted to read again, like, uh, I don't know, I've just been reading Robinson Crusoe. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing. So you're walking along, yeah. it's sunny or it's misty or it's yeah. raining, your brain's expanding, your waist is diminishing, and you just feel great. And I think in modern society, we don't do enough of that. So my ambition now... Or both, isn't it? We don't do enough of that, that taking time out to create space to do that. We don't do enough walking anymore. No. Everybody thinks you've got to run and jog, and, and that's not the answer. The answer is walking. Walking's a man's best medicine. Who said that? Hippocrates, I think it was, 2,000 years ago. And also, walking, at your walking, age, and my age, and our weight that we were, if yep. we ran, as, yep. uh, again, as Seema Hotra says this, yep. you'll end up knackering your knees. You yes. I see people running past me and they've got that thing on the, the iPhone yep. trapped and stuff. Or they're on cycles yep. and they're cycling like mad, dressed in Lycra, yep. right? And you I think, was there. No. Well, you're mad. I was there. Yeah. It doesn't do any good. No. doesn't do any I good. I was there and in fact it became a hobby. I get obsessed. Yeah. I, I, whatever I do, I become obsessed with it. And the year I became, in fact, two things happened that year I learned about this stuff. That year I became obsessed with cycling. So that Christmas, everybody bought me all the stuff, da 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 and it was that January when I found out about how to beat my obesity. Because I was a beast, yeah, I was cycling I've like crazy. I've seen the beaches. <laughs> Very <laughs> obese. And, uh, and I was cycling like crazy, getting fatter and fatter. Yeah. You can't lose weight from cycling. You can't lose weight from jogging. My son, bless him again, I poisoned him for 20 odd years. He's 28 years old now, he's an airline pilot, bless him. He's getting his weight a bit under control. Both his legs have been, re both his knees have been replaced. Because he was doing sport and running yeah. and football and rugby. When you can't do that when you're yeah. overweight, you shouldn't do it overweight. And Asim says it absolutely right, and we all believe it now. And I'm like you, the amount of times, and I haven't done it yet, I'm, I, 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 it's gonna happen at some stage, because I'm just gonna lose it. I drive past people, and it's all right seeing somebody fit and young jogging, that's fine, you carry on. But when I see somebody our age jogging that's overweight, I'm, I, I'm gonna have to do this at some stage. I have to stop the car and get it and say, look, can I just ask you why you're yeah. running? I say that to Lisa, I say, where's those business cards? Well, and it's like a short, you know when you've been married forever, yeah. you, you have like a code. Yeah. And what I'm saying is, we need to give them one of yeah. our cards. Yeah, yeah. And she's rather into, I haven't done it just like you. Yeah. But you see women sometimes running and yeah. their leg movement is all out of place. And so you just know their hips are going to be a real yeah. problem later. And that's and, what Asim said, isn't it? He said, look, yeah. you, you think you're doing it because that's what you think you need to do to lose weight. It's wrong because it's all, it's 80% diet, yeah. that all the other stuff. Yeah, you know, he's the 20%, the, the lifestyle, the uh, getting out in the sun. Again, another thing we can go off on a whole topic about, yeah. is sunshine good or bad for you? Uh, getting enough sleep, getting enough rest, the meditation that you've talked about, that you get. It's, but it's 80% food. And you just want to say to those people, 
Stop for a minute, sure. Stop running, stop hurting yourself because if it's about living healthy and happier for longer, you can have so many problems. You think you've got a problem now with your weight. Wait. You can have a massive problem 20 years down the line. It's the same. See, I believe in gentle walking. Yep. I, I, you don't need to put lycra on. Yep. You don't need to buy expensive stuff. As you get more into it, you might want a, a decent pair of shoes yep. and invest in them, 80, 100, 150 quid because you, it's now a part of your life. You would yep. invest. And that's what I keep saying to people, invest in yourself and also be selfish. Yep. You will never, ever get how you want to get if you're blown off course by people saying, go on, go on to you, have another pint, it won't hurt you. You've got to get out of that. But also, I feel that the walking uh, frees your mind and I think that's all you need to do. I don't think, you know, like Jim, I do some weightlifting, yep. but I've got a bench which I bought, but you don't need to buy a bench, you could just do it on a chair. Yep. Two or three sets of dumbbells, different weights, yep. that's all. And again, in a sense, coronavirus, people are saying, now don't go to a gym yep. because of transmission of the infection. Yep. But you just don't need it. You Arnold really Schwarzenegger don't became need Mr. It. Universe with hardly any weights, yeah. just doing body, body weight. Body, yeah. Press ups, sit ups. Here's another cracker. I walk in Warwick Park, St. Nicholas Park, uh, just down the road from where you are, and I walk around that park. Um, sometimes I'm doing it at half five in the morning. And I'm on my own, because I don't yep. like walking with anyone, or even Lisa, I just like to be on my own. Yep. And we haven't got a big enough dog to take. I've inherited a toy poodle, don't ask, it's my daughter's. But I just... Well, you've seen my two dogs, yeah, so... Yeah. So I just walk around, I know, I'm going to get a proper dog soon. But I just walk around, and then the gym opens, and yep. there's a fabulous public gym and swimming pool, yep. yeah, owned by the council, it's yep. great. But it's got huge glass windows where the gym is. And as I walk past, and the, I see the breath coming out of me, I see these people running on treadmills looking out to the park. <laughs> and they're like this, and they've got their headphones in, they're not communicating, and it's just like, you're mad. Now, I've got my earpieces in, I walk, and some old boy might say, hello, how are you? And we might stop and pass the number down, I can just click it, click it off, but I can still hear him. But these people, they put the headphones in, they don't speak to anybody, they're on the treadmill, they think they're doing brilliantly, and actually they're damaging themselves, both physically and mentally, because when you get in the fresh air, and you meet other people, your brain expands and loads of stuff disappears. I know all about the endorphins and all that. That's all happening as well. But you've got to be part of a community. So I, I walk around the park four or five times. Then I go up through Warwick and the shops are opening. And no, so often I come, go uptown, down, and you see the shops opening, like the local butcher. And it's a bit like being in a Jack and Ori story. And then when you come back later, it's busy and the traffic's built and all the kids are going to the schools. It's just wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just wonderful. wonderful. And that's what it's about. Isn't you've got to take time. Isn't this something you, you uh, admit to being depressed for a lot of time when you're overweight? Isn't this something uplifting about being out in nature? Like we were yeah. supposed to be. Yeah. We're supposed to be outdoors, aren't yeah. we? You know, we were, yeah. Let me give you another tip, if anybody's listening. Everyone's got a canal bile. Drop down onto the canal. Even if it's, say, in the middle of town like Birmingham, more yep. canals in Venice. Yep. Get down onto a canal. Yep. Here at Warwick, where, where, where I live, it's very lucky. I can walk along the canal, yep. I can walk through the park, uh, along the Avon, yep. and then you go up these old wrought iron steps, you get mm. on the canal, and I can walk on the canal all the way to Leamington Spa. Oh, yeah. So it's about six miles, something like that. I do that, and I'm on my own, and nobody else is there, and then I see the swans, and I see the do and I can't, I think, sometimes I think, go on to you, you mad. And somebody said to me, <laughs> how long do you walk for a day? I said, you're asking the wrong question. They said, what do you mean? I, I said, know. I just walk. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I said, because some days I can do the same walk and I can do it in an hour. Yeah. Some days it might be three hours. I can yeah. be three hours, what are you doing? Yeah. I'm looking at the swans. And I found this swan nest, right, on the opposite bank. And obviously the female swan wasn't, didn't get off it for days, weeks, it yeah. felt like, right? And eventually she did. And then the signets were there. And I know I sound really poncy. No, no, this is but beautiful. But it's brilliant. This is, this is life. This is yeah. what, you know, this is what real life is about, isn't it? And I noticed you're not wearing a watch. I don't wear a I watch. I never wear a watch. And I, I wrote that in my first book, that if you look at the, the what they call the blue zones, those areas around the world yeah. where people live, you know, into the centenarians and sometimes super centenarians, 110 years, they don't wear watches. And they don't wear watches because what, there are times when we're in business and there are yeah. times of the, yeah, and school and all that and kids you have to there are times of course we have to wear a no, watch and have an alarm and what, but when you don't have to get up when you when you feel you've, you've got enough energy go to bed when you feel tired and then go for a walk and don't count how long you've been walking walk till you enjoy it and when you finish go yeah. home you know, I feel a bit like yeah. that guy in the film um, uh, what's it called the film with uh, Tom Hanks 
Where he just walks, uh, just runs. Oh. Not Rain Man. Uh, no, no. Oh, oh. Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Yeah. I do feel like him some days. Yeah. I'm just walking. Yeah. I'm just doing it. I mean, my big ambition, my wife works at the RSC, which has been closed down in Stratford at the theatre there. And one of my ambitions, I tried it one day. Uh, I walked from Warwick along the canal, and I was going to walk all the way to Stratford. I'm the only bloke who can get lost on a canal, which is straight. <laughs> I ended up in nearly bloody Birmingham, right? <laughs> so then I've looked at it again now, and I know why you need to come up one canal and then in this little village, cross the road and go yeah. on another. I missed it, yeah. but I will do it one day. Yeah. But that day I did walk 15 or 16 miles and I phoned her and I said, I'm in this pub. She said, what's it called? I said, I told her the name. She said, where is it? I said, I don't know. I, just, <laughs> I said, can you have a look? Just put this in and come and pick me up because I'm absolutely cream cracking. Yeah. But it's stuff like that I yeah. just lose myself and I okay. I am lucky because I'm self-employed so I can take that time I guess but I think everybody can because people yeah. say to me well I can't because I'm busy well so get up earlier then yeah you can if you Go want to bed to. earlier yeah. get up earlier yeah and, and I've, I yeah. kind of just said during this um this coronavirus uh disaster don't use that as an excuse not to carry on eating properly Yes. If you prepare now, you can carry on. Yes. Because we all try to make excuses. And don't get me wrong, I'm not a saint. You know, it's a birthday, you might have beer rather than when you know you should stay on the wine. We all do that, but the secret is then to get back on it, isn't it? The secret then is to say, that's not taking me away from my lifestyle. I mean, yeah. I, I haven't eaten bread and potatoes and I've got no ambition. I mean, I go yeah. for a curry, I've got some great curry houses where I live, and um, Mr. Muhammad, who runs the bull I go to, he's now got used to the fact he ain't going to sell me a £2.95p now. <laughs> we wear all his profit is, right? <laughs> so I say... Well, the first time you went in, I bet it was a different story. Oh, it was. He just looked at me as if I was an alien. Well, you don't want rice? No. That's what he said. Nan? I said, no. <laughs> rice? No. Uh, what's those things you have at the beginning? that Crocodiles? Yeah, no. No. <laughs> so he said, what do you want then? I said, well, um, I'll have butter chicken. I'm looking after me weight. And he looked at me and said, so you what? Because, you know, it's lady with butter. And then I have something like... Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, spinach yep. uh, or aloo sag or something like, um, what's that one? Uh, the lady's fingers, okra. Uh, have a side dish. So you still have a load of food yep. on the table. But when you get up, this, I keep telling my mates about this because they don't believe me. When you get up off the table, yep. you don't need three short people underneath your tummy <laughs> to hold you up. Yes. You know yes. that whole thing about yep. you can't, you can drink eight pints of lager. We've all done this. Uh, and then have a curry, but try having a curry and then eight pints of lager. Now, I'm not suggesting this. I would say it isn't the curry, it's the bread. Yes. It's a bit like, you know, I had a mate, I had a mate who used to call him Donna. People say, what do you call him Donna? I said, well, it's a bit like a Donna kebab. Nobody fancies him until they've had eight pints. <laughs> <laughs> it's that kind of thing, you know? It's, and, and it's when you learn these little tricks, yep. It, yeah. You just feel so much better, don't you? You yeah. just feel... Yeah. I mean, my advice in the coronavirus is, don't you, like you say, don't use it as an excuse to eat poor food. You can't go to the restaurants at the moment. So no. take that time. That night you would have gone to the restaurant, go to your website, go to my website, learn a new recipe yeah. for the first, something you've never done before that's healthy. Yeah. Use every opportunity that you would have gone out that night to the restaurant. Can't go tonight because it's all shut up. Let's learn a new dish together. I agree. And, uh, you know, the, 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 get cooking. Get cooking. Get cooking. Yeah, that's the message that you keep keep yeah, saying on your it's website. So, it's so easy and it's so um, it's so delightful to do it, you know. And, and discover the beauty of things like uh, eating an avocado with a teaspoon. Just slice it in half, get rid of the stone, yeah. be careful when you go there. Get yeah. rid of the stone and then just get uh, a teaspoon and scoop it out. And then when no one's looking, just flick it back a bit, the skin, and get the rest of it off. <laughs> Don't waste anything. You know, I, lo I love King Henry VIII type food, you know, yeah. ribs yeah. and uh, stuff where, you know, lamb, lamb cutlets. Oh, gorgeous. Fry them. Yeah. That's, a, that's the thing I learned. You can get lamb cutlets. I used to get the lamb cutlet, cook them face down, if you understand what I mean, yeah. and then I'd cut the fat off, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's the best bit. Yeah. So now I get them, I put them on their side with the fat down first yeah. in a frying pan. Yeah with oil, oil, whatever oil you're using, coconut or whatever, I render that fat down so that fat goes crispy and disappears a bit. Yeah. Then I flick them over, load of salt, a bit more oil or whatever I'm cooking in, and then I take them out while they're still pink, yeah. and then I put them in a big square bowl, say four if I'm having them, with a big dollop of mint sauce that we made ourselves, because nice. you've got to be careful. That's another way you put weight on, the condiments. Uh, a little bit of mint sauce and then just dip them with your fingers, Lovely. hold them like that. And obviously you'll be careful nowadays with the virus, but then lick your finger. 
Henry VIII grub. Yeah. Knowing full well it's doing you good, especially if you accompany it with a huge salad on yeah. the side in a different bowl. Yeah. That's you the kind of food I like. You're the same as me. I used to cut the fat off because I used to think it was right. I was with the Maasai. This was the year before I would went primal. I was with the Maasai. I was obese. And I'd get up and go jogging every morning. And, uh, and they'd see me do this. And then that afternoon, they grab this goat, they, they kill it in front of me, and, and, and they, you know, they cook it and they give it me, and I take the fat off. And this guy, this Maasai, uh, spoke a little bit of English. He said, yeah. Mr. Mr. Steve, Mr. Steve, you do that running thing yeah. every morning. I've noticed every morning you do that running thing, and you take the fat off to be big, big English man. I went, no, the opposite. I do the running every <laughs> yeah. morning and take the fat off because I want to look like you, slender. And he went, it's not working, Mr. Stone. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was one of the three things that, that I, I got to change. Yeah. Everything I've been taught must be wrong then because he's right. He looks brilliant. He doesn't go jogging. He looks slender and well, fit and, and, and he eats the fat. And that's one of the, that was one of my catalyst moments. Well, that know? is the primal way, isn't it? Yep. Uh, not just you, but the primal way of eating. Yep. We used to run naked across a plane, yep. grab a buffalo or whatever it was, slaughter it yep. and then eat it. And this was before we had agriculture, before we had cereal. And then we'd eat the meat for two or three days, yes. however long the tribe was going to eat yep. it. All of the meat, the offal. The... Yeah, evident, until it was all gone. Yep. Then we'd eat the bones and chew the bones and get all the marrow out and we'd get the fat out and all the Collagen rest of it. Collagen and all the yeah, good stuff. Yeah, because we yep. didn't know how to smoke or, yep. or, or preserve food. And that's the way it was. Yep. We'd just been conned into this other thing. You know, yep. it, you know it's, it's so annoying. It's so frustrating. I don't know whether we'll ever get the message out there completely because, uh, again, Lisa, when she's at work, she'll go and, you know, take because she's not had time to eat, because she's been doing something else. She'll get to work and do one shift, then do another shift, and then she'll, she'll go and get a load of vegetables or a piece of chicken, whatever, and then she'll go across, and people, actors, all the actors at the RSC, and uh, she pours on loads of olive oil or loads of cheese, and they go, oh, what are you doing? You know, how come you've got, you know, you've got such a perfect body, da-da-da-da-da, with all that fat? She says, that's because... I eat the fat, as long as it's good fat. And people just don't understand that. It's been totally and utterly demonised. Yes. As you know, because you talk about it in your book, it's all based on fake, false science. Yep. Back there when, in, in, you know, with um, the president having a heart attack and then Ansel the stuff Keys from Harvard. And, yeah. Yeah, 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 and that yeah. Ansel Keys guy. Yeah. Basically, they lied. Yep. They massaged the figures. Yep. All the dietary advice comes from there. Agreed. They now all know it's wrong. They know, they yeah. absolutely know. Yeah. And they're still lying to us and they're still killing people. And so when the sugar scandal yeah. really breaks, and of course people who run sugar, they turn slavery into an industrial mechanism. They don't give an SH1T about Agreed. your health. Right? Yeah. These people treated black people as subhuman, right? Their yeah. ancestors, yeah. right? So they don't care. So when the sugar scandal finally breaks, it'll be bigger than tobacco. Agreed. Because they aim sugar in all its forms at children. Yep. Try and eat a Farley's Rusk and you'll know what I mean. Yep. Or, or baby food. And that's so terrible, so terrible because it's giving us disease. It definitely is promoting disease, almost from cradle. I'd suggest even perhaps before, because when you're pregnant, oh, you're pregnant, brilliant, let's get a cake. Right. <laughs> oh, you've had a baby, let's have a cake. Right. Oh, you've died, you're dead, let's have a cake. Am I right? <laughs> It's a great doctor, and I'm laughing. I shouldn't laugh because it's one of those. It's just the way you deliver it is so funny. But it's a, such a serious matter, and I shouldn't be laughing. But Dr. James Gulnick uh, runs a charity. He's one of the. Uh, he's a doctor. He's a number one dentist yeah. in the UK, and his charity is all about changing the reward system because exactly that. Cake, 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 cake. And then he said, "What do you do with, with your kids when you have a party? You give them a goodie bag. What's in the goodie bag? It's always sweet, sweet, yeah. sweets." He said, we, we, "We're killing our kids." the wrong reward system. I put down my obesity and my type 2 diabetes, apart from the plate, I also put it down to midget gems, lion midget gems, especially the black ones, <laughs> and wine gums. When I was doing a breakfast show in Luton, we'd finish the show and we'd go to a, an Irish working cafe, you know, yeah. working blokes cafe, and most of the plate was fine, apart from I'd have the beans and I'd have loads of chips with it. Then I'd go to the garage, on, as I went up the hill out of Luton to go back on the M1, there's a garage. And uh, I wouldn't go in, in for petrol, but I'd go in and I'd probably have two cream eggs and I'd have eaten one of the cream eggs before I got back in the car. I'd have a big bag of wine gums. 
And that's when I first found out about my diabetes because I suddenly got real bad sugar rushes and stuff. But that's what I was eating. And, and you know, because I'm not, I'm not really a sweet person. If we went out for a meal and you said, oh, do you want a, do you want a pudding? I'd most times say no. Uh, Certainly now I would, but you know, even then I would, before I knew I'd have cheese or whatever, I'd have nothing, because I'd be full. Um, talking of which, that's another great thing. People just eat and eat and eat. Eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full, it's very simple. Reconnect your brain to your stomach. But people don't do this. I was at Oxford, again, with my daughter. And we're not lecturing, because we were both the same, weren't we? Yeah, yeah, we no, the same. I, I'm just never lectured to people. Great, weren't we? But here's, we a great, here's a great example. There's a fantastic sandwich bar in Oxford, Browns or something it's called. And uh, it's like being in an episode of Inspector Morse. So we're sitting outside there, it's a lovely summer's day. Oh, what do you want, kids? You know, and we call it a batch in Coventry, which is a BAP, basically. Yep. Do you want batches? Yeah, yeah, I love this, I love that. Right, I'll go in and get them. So I'll go in, get them, bring them back, coffees. And again, coffee, of course, it's latte and bloody cappuccino, which is full of milk, no good. And then I've eaten mine and I stand up. And you haven't met my wife yet, you have to meet her. She says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to get another one. She said, what do you mean you're going to get another one? I said, I need another one, my sugar's low. Yeah. I used to get that feeling that my sugar was low. It was actually my sugar high. Yeah. So I'd go, I said, oh, I'm getting one. Don't you tell me, I'm 45 years. <laughs> you know what it's like. So I'd go and get one. But then I didn't need it. I didn't want it. And it's that kind of behavior you've got to change. And yeah. It's like snacking, isn't it? If my mum died when I was 11 years old, if my mum came back now, 50 odd years ago, later, and she, and I said, she said, what are all these people, what's, what have they got in the hand? I said, it's coffee mum, got coffee cups. She'd say, how much is that? And if I told her it was like two pound 50, three pound if you have a bit more, well, it's more expensive than beer. She would just go mental, wouldn't she? Why do you need a bloody cup of coffee in your hand when you're shopping? Yeah. Answer, you don't. Yeah. And once you start breaking that, but we live in a snack culture. Again, I don't want to go on about Italy too but, much. But that's because we were told, eat little bit often. Who yeah, came rubbish. up with that? The snack industry. Yeah. And if you go to Italy, it's changing a bit now in Milano and places like that, but in most Italian towns, they get up in the morning, this bit isn't too healthy, they have a fag and they have an espresso and they have a pastry often. But... They then take time for lunch and they go to a cafe and they have something. And people think it's all pasta, pasta, pasta. If you've been it's to not. Italy, you know it's, it's not. not. Yeah. And then they have the main meal. They do not snack. We snack all the time. Look at how many chicken joints there are on every high street. Yep. Look at how many coffee shops there are. I mean, in Leamington, yep. great example, I think there's 38 <laughs> coffee shops in Leamington. Do we really need 38? Do we need 30? Do we yeah. need 15? Do we need 10? Probably yeah. 10 would be fine. Yeah. That's the problem. And it wouldn't matter, because we're not having to go coffee, because coffee on Coffee's itself fantastic. is fantastic. It's the new coffee, isn't it? Yeah. It's the new coffee. It's those lattes. It's the stuff they put in it, the sugar, the syrup. The, yeah. yeah. And here's another one. My father-in-law was in hospital with sepsis in Coventry uh, Hospital about six months ago. We went to see him, and... Um, there's a Costa or a Starbucks downstairs. And you walk in and it looks just like the ones on the high street. Not only that, it's got all the syrups. Yeah. So they're still selling all the sugar whilst they're... And of course the patients, you know, you know what they're like, they come down with the drips and they go outside yeah. for a fag. Yeah. I, don't, I can't get my head around that. that. But then they get a coffee as well yeah. with syrup in it. And all of this is just not joined up thinking. This isn't, again, lecturing to people. No, no, no. It's well, just Dr. Simulatra says, you know, he's so fed up of that. And, yeah. you know, so many doctors have told me that same story that they, they, they you know, they, Dr. Seem, he's, he's, he's done the cardiology a bit, he's put the guy's new heart in yeah. and he comes to see him the next day <laughs> and he's given him a lecture about food and he said, well, look, the only food choice I had earlier was yeah. burger or pasta? How yeah. can you lecture me while or in a white hospital? bread sandwich? Exactly. Yeah. And it's just, it is just terrible. But you see, another catchphrase we've got with simple as fat is we say, take back control. I know it's a bit like Brexit, but for all the politics to one side, you can take back control. You. Yeah. And people say to me, is this allowed? Because that's the diet philosophy, isn't it? Yeah. I say, anything's allowed. Yeah. You make the decision. Yeah. You know, you take responsibility you take your own decision and take responsibility yeah. for that decision then no decision is ever wrong yeah. you might if things change you'll have to make another decision yeah but don't ask me whether you can have a, a sandwich yeah. or is it okay for me to have a cheat day yeah. you decide i'll tell you that that breaks down to 15 grams of sugar yeah so then you make the decision yeah so, 
John, you know what? We could talk, and this won't be the last time you're on here because it's been fascinating. On, no, I don't I know about your that. Honesty and your openness. And I've only got one set of material. Don't ask me back. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we, we could go on for another three hours, I'm sure. Yeah, sure. But look, look, great meeting. Tell everybody one more time about your website, how they find it, and 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 and, and just a big thank you, an okay. absolute thank you for being here. But tell everybody quickly well, about your website. You find it easy. It's www.simpleasfat.com. Simpleasfat.com, all one word. Have a look at it, see if we can help you. Uh, you do have to pay, um, but you can either pay yearly or monthly. Um, have a look at the success stories, if you don't believe me. Incredible, yeah. uh, you won't believe. Oh, I must, before I go, we have a lady, in fact, it's James's mum. She's a pensioner. She can't walk, she's on a mobility scooter, you know, like you see in Benidorm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's, <laughs> she, they're everywhere in Benidorm. So she's got one of them, and when she gets off her scooter to go around town, she now has got into walking around the supermarket. She gets off the scooter, Brilliant. grabs the trolley, and walks around. Two and a half stone, that lady's lost. Fantastic. And she's 77 or something. It's, it's, we haven't invented anything. Mm -hmm. And nor have you with fat and fear, not anything. We're mm -hmm. angry, we want to tell people about it. No one is, has invented this really, apart from if you went right back to banting and the rest. But yeah. even then, it's just about eating good fat and getting rid of starchy carbs. The rest of it is motivation, which I think is what Simplest Fat set up to do yeah. to help people get on this track and change their lives. Now, normally the end of a podcast has two people, people two questions. Yeah. Give us a snapshot of what it is. You just did that bit. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Final one, I always ask all doctors and experts and people like yourself that have been on the journey, what is Gaunty's legend, uh, legacy going to be? What do you want it to be? What do you want your legacy to well, be? Well, my problem at the moment, I want just more people to look at Simple as Fat. I want to change, I don't, I'm not Jesus, but I would, I would love it if loads of people change the way they eat, the more people start to eat our way, whether it's me or you or whatever, then hopefully the dietary guidelines would change. Um, I'm not gonna stop shouting about the dietary guidelines. And when people say to me, you're not a nutritionist, or I had some jumped up nutritionist at the House of Commons say this to me, right? <laughs> I won't say his name on here. Right. He said, what right have you got to, to tell people what they're eating? Right? Skinny, right? I see more meat on Aubrey Allen's The Butcher's pencil than this geezer, right? What right have you? I said, I'll tell you what effing right I've got. I was a type two diabetic for 15 years and it's idiots like you who made that continue. That's my experience. I know what it is to be ashamed. I know, and Miriam Margoyles did that great show the other day. And people go, oh, you shouldn't say fat, you know, it shames people. No, I was fat, I was morbidly obese, but what, it was people like you who've never been fat, and then he said his name then, how dare you lecture? And yeah. you're telling me you're a nutritionist, right? I could be a nutritionist next week, you can do a three month course, I can be one. You put, oh no, I went to university. Oh really, right? Oh really? Yeah. I'm so impressed. Yeah. Now, I'm not talking about doctors. Doctors uh, are a different thing. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my legacy, I would like people just to take control of their lives. I'd like the dietary guidelines to change. And I'd just like people to understand. Yeah, well, let me just finish on this. People say, what do you replace the chips with, Gaunty, when you're having steak and chips? More steak. <laughs> right? <laughs> More steak? What? And your problem is, what? No hash browns with your breakfast. What do you have instead? More bacon! <laughs> More bacon, yeah. What about tomato ketchup? Well, did you know there's three teaspoons and an average serving of sugar in every single bit yeah, of tomato make ketchup? Your own. Make your own. Or get some cherry tomatoes, fry them in with your bacon and butter, and then squash them if you want a little bit of sweetness. That's what it's about, yeah? Yeah, I'm with you. Lovely, lovely spending time with you, my man. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> no, lovely. You're an absolute star. Uh, if you are listening to it on a podcast, do, if you get a chance, listen again. There's so many gems in there. Or watch it on YouTube. Go on, T. Thank you very much, no my problem. man. Lovely. If you enjoyed this podcast, then why not subscribe to the full series so you can hear from all the incredible health professionals we spoke to. For the full story, you can also get the book Fat and Furious, written by Steve Bennett, available on Amazon. And to say a huge thank you for watching us here on YouTube, we are even offering you an exclusive Amazon discount code so you can get yourself a copy. For more details, head to the description below.